jump into 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter one, verse nine. Let's stand for the reading of the word if we can. And it says this, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel, the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. I'm going to stop there this morning and open up in prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. Jesus, I thank you for our hearts just being receptive to what you're doing in our lives. So I just thank you for the power of the word that has the ability to change us. Uh, Lord, to just renew our minds. And Lord, I just thank you today of just us having a fresh perspective of you and your heart towards us this morning, Jesus. So we thank you for your goodness and your heart, Jesus, and for your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. When I was in uh, elementary school, um, I was very self-conscious of the way that I looked uh, for many reasons, being that the first one was is I had a bull cut. Um, I was sport of that thing for probably about, um, I don't know, all the way up to junior high school, I think. So I had a blonde, white blonde bull haircut. Um, that was my hairstyle for the longest time. I had like white blonde hair. And then I had some glasses that kind of looked like Harry Potter glasses. Um, they, they tinted when he went outside in the sun, and it took about five minutes too long when he came back inside for them to transition back. It's like, it's about time now, right? But uh, that was some of the things that I wore. But I was, I was a size husky as well. I was kind of a, a, you know, a junkier kid and just kind of self-conscious of the, the way that, that I looked. And um, when I was older, when my teeth fell out, my adult teeth came in and my front teeth, one of my, my teeth was very crooked in the front. And I uh, had kind of like a gap there. So I was very self-conscious of when I, people took pictures um, of smiling. I would never smile with my, my mouth open. I'd just smile with my, with my mouth closed because I was just self-conscious of my smile and my teeth and stuff like that. And um, my parents are like, you know, we're going to get you braces. So I'm like, thank you, Jesus. They got me braces, spent a lot of money to get it done, and got my teeth straightened. I still have a permanent uh, brace in the bottom of my mouth actually still today. But um, they straightened my teeth. But still, when pictures came along, I didn't want to smile with my teeth uh, showing. I just wanted to smile with my mouth closed because I still felt self-conscious about it. And my mom always got on me. She's like, son, show me your teeth. I want to see you smile. We paid a lot of money for your teeth to be straight. Let's see that beautiful smile, son. And I'm like, I just can't do it. I'm like, mm, I'm just going to smile. And then it's like, okay, I'll give you a little bit here. And uh, she's like, I just want to see your smile. We paid a lot for uh, money for your teeth to be straight and have that kind of smile. And even on Facebook, when she'd see posts of me not smiling, she'd post on there and comment and be like, hey, let's see that smile. I want to see those teeth. We paid a lot of money for that. I want to see that beautiful smile. So even to this day, I still hear my mom's voice when people are taking pictures like, let's see those teeth. Let's see that beautiful smile. And I think maybe some of us today, God may say that to us. I want to see you smile. I want to see you full of joy, overflowing with joy in your life. Because I paid a high price for you. I purchased you with my blood. I gave my life for you. I gave everything for you. I've redeemed you. I've restored you. I've made you whole. I brought you into my kingdom. I've made you my sons and my daughters. I've done so much for you. And I delight in you. And I have so much pleasure in you. And I want you to take pleasure in me and delight lie to me. I just enjoy you and I want you to smile because I rejoice over you. I have joy over you. I want to see that kind of smile. I want to see that joy in your life, overflowing joy, the kind of joy that you have in your life that you are running and nobody's chasing you, the kind of joy that you have in your life that you're, you're dancing, there's no music even playing, the kind of joy in your life that you have that you're, you're crying and nobody's made you cry, but there's tears of joy because you have so much joy overflowing in your life, the kind of joy that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. That's the kind of joy that I want you to have. That you'd have a kind of joy when somebody may slap you. Blessing comes out and not cursing. That you have a joy in your life when people persecute 
persecute you and they speak evil things about you, lie about you, that you're happy and that you're blessed and that you're full of joy. And I want you to have a kind of joy when everything's going wrong in your life. Everything's crumbling. You're going through hardships. You're going through trials. You're going through difficulties. That, and you can count it all joy when various trials come in your life. I want you to have that kind of joy, overflowing joy in your life. That's the kind of joy I think he wants us yeah. to have, overflowing in our lives. You know, something that really kind of just lightens me and just makes me smile is when my kids are smiling and laughing. Just something about it when my kids are laughing and smiling. And it's even cuter now because my son, Ethan, he's lost both his front teeth. So it's like when he smiles, it's like there's nothing there. It's just like you just can't help but smile, look at that, and laugh because there's no teeth there. I mean, it's just, it's just funny. But I, when my kids laugh and when they, they smile, it's just like it lightens me and it makes me want to smile as well. It's just contagious, and I just want to laugh with them. And I, I think God the Father is like that too. And we, when we laugh, he enjoys our laughter. And, and when we smile, he, I think he laughs over that as well because he has that kind of joy because he is a joyful God. Yeah. That's who he is. He is a joyful, loving God. And the scripture that we read this morning in 1 Timothy, Paul is talking to Timothy. And he's saying, Timothy, the law is not for the righteous. That's what he kind of goes into what we read. I know it was kind of heavy stuff, the beginning part there. But he's saying the law is not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, the immoral. It's supposed to be like a school teacher made to bring people to the realization that they need God to come in their life, that they need a Savior, that they need a Redeemer. It's not made to just beat up on people or whip up on people. It's not just made to bring forth arguments, but it's made for people to see that they need a Savior, that they need a Redeemer. And he goes on, he says this glorious gospel. The glorious gospel. You know, the gospel is the good news. It is the good news. If, if we're preaching the gospel and there's not good news at the end of it, that's not the gospel. It is good news. The good news is if I've messed up, I can be made right. The good news is if I am blind, I can see. The good news is if I'm bound, I can be free. The good news is if I'm, I'm captive, I can be liberated. That is the good news. That is the gospel. Jesus came to bring forth good news. It said, joy to the world, the Lord has come and he brought forth good news and people that hear the good news they receive it joy is going to be a byproduct of that but it's the good news of this gospel and he goes on he says this glorious gospel by the blessed god has been committed to my trust by the blessed god that word blessed we find that in the sermon of the mount that jesus gives and the beatitudes we see this in the greek language that this word uh, bless actually means happy that's what it means there blessed are they are happy are they? So what he's really saying, this glorious gospel has been entrusted to me by a happy God. It's a happy God. And for some of us to think of a happy God, it's like we may not see him that way. I mean, a happy God. Let, let that sink in a little bit. He's, he's a happy God because some of us may not see him as a happy God. We see him kind of as bipolar. Or, you know, he's, he's got mood swings. He's up and down sometimes. I mean, when I grew up in church, the picture of Jesus on the wall, I was kind of miserable being there. It looked like Jesus was kind of miserable being there as well. I mean, he's just, you know, just standing there with the peace sign. I'm like, I don't know. And then, you know, petting the sheep. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've seen the, the pictures with Jesus, the eyes that follow you, you know, it's just kind of like, I just can't escape it. It's like, you're staring me down. Just, you just want to confess every sin. It's like, I know Jesus. I told my wife, the kids ate the Oreos. I did it. I confess. It's just like, Jesus looks a little creepy in some of these pictures. He doesn't look very happy. That's kind of our, our, our mindset and our view of God that he's maybe scowling, that he's upset, that he's angry, but he's a, a happy God. And you ask most people, you, most people would say that God is ticked. He's ticked at somebody. He's, he's coming after somebody. He's coming after you all. I mean, bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do? God's going to come running after you. I mean, you can run, but you cannot hide. He is going to get you. I mean, that's kind of our mentality. And that's been kind of me sometimes. Like, man, if, if God's coming out of anybody, he's coming after me. It's like, I'll never do that again. I'm sorry, God. And, and we kind of have that mindset sometimes. And I remember in the fourth grade, um, I had a teacher that... Um, he actually threw chalk at us when we disrupted, and he'd be writing on the board, and all of a sudden he'd turn around and throw chalk at you, and, and if you were being disruptive or talking. And he also had a, a paddle that was called the motivator. It said motivator on it, and that's what they used to, to paddle kids at the time. And that one broke, so they came out with motivator number two. 
So that was just hanging up on the wall for everybody to see to bring you some motivation. And, and sometimes that's kind of our, can be our view of God, that God's walking around with the motivator. He's going to whip up on you and bring some motivation. I want to get somebody today. And that can be our view sometimes of him, but that's not who he is. He is a happy God. That's who he is. And, and there is the wrath of God, understanding that. There is the wrath of God, but God poured out his wrath on Jesus. He poured his wrath out on Jesus. He's no longer angry. There may be angry birds, but there's not an angry God. He's not up and down. He doesn't have mood swings. It's not like on Sundays when we're singing to him and we're worshiping him. He's like, man, they're singing that song, Do It Again. I love that song. And, and uh, man, I'm going to do it again because they're singing that. I just love that. But then on Mondays, everybody's complaining. We're not worshiping it anymore. He's like, man, I'm just not doing people today. I'm going to come after somebody today. They're not worshiping me. I don't, I don't like this. I'm not doing people today. I'm hitting the snooze button. God's not like that. There's no up and downs in the kingdom of God. God is not up and down, but he's got a smile on his face. That's who he is. He's a happy God. So I've got good news for you. Jesus is not a sour God. He's not baptized in lemon juice. He's not. And for us as believers, as Christians, we should not be baptized in lemon juice either. We should be some of the most joyful people on the planet. We should have the most joy erupting out of our lives. Now I'm not saying we're robots and that we don't have times of sadness or times of sorrows. We do have hardships sometimes, but that there's something inside of us that's eternal, that's working inside of us, outside of us, that's joy that he gives us on the inside. There should be something where we should say, you know what, I, I choose to have joy today. I'm going to rejoice today because of everything he's done. I mean, he saved us. He's set us free. He's washed us with his blood. He's redeemed us. He's made us his own, his sons and daughters. We have so much to be joyful about. Even on your worst day, you have so much to be joyful about. Even yesterday, our, our water heater busted and it went everywhere. Water leaked everywhere. And it was not a good day. And this morning, I had to take a cold shower. It felt like water from Antarctica. I'm like, you know what? I still have water. Even though it's cold, I still have a reason to be joyful today because God is good in my life. We have a reason to be joyful. If anybody, it should be us that should be joyful because we as believers, we can change an atmosphere. I mean, one person who complains can change a whole atmosphere, but one person full of the Holy Ghost and joy can change a whole atmosphere. When they look at us and say, man, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is. There is something different about you. You're not like anybody else. If you want to be a great evangelist, just have the, the, the strength of the joy of the Lord in your life. I mean, people will look at you and say, man, there's something different about you. That's kind of what happened to me a little bit when I worked a job 10 years ago. I was just not really preaching to anybody. I was trying to be uh, myself and um, people just gravitated towards me. And, um, you know, people were saying like I was some kind of youth minister and I wasn't a youth pastor at the time or anything like that. But um, I was just trying to do my best at the, at the job and not complain and, and not be like everybody else at it. And not saying I was perfect at it, but people would come along and say, man, there's, there's something different about you. And, and one guy came up to me and said, you know what? I don't care what people say about you. You're a good man. I'm like, what, do you, what are people saying about me? And it's like, <laughs> I, I don't get that part. When are you going to let fill me on that one? And, uh, and when one lady came up to me and was like, man, I, just, I, don't, I don't understand how you're not getting negative like everybody else. I'm like, I, it's just Jesus, I think, you know, and it's him working in my life. It became an opportunity for me to share the love of God and Jesus working in my life. We, we become uh, an example of his love by being something different, his joy working in our lives. It should be working in us and through us, his joy. When people look at us, they see something different. They see his joy through us. As I believe we sh should be a joyful people. We're created to laugh, I believe. We're created to be joyful. I think sometimes we can get maybe a little too serious at times. You know, I think we're all created with a sense of humor. And, um, you know, if you look at people who say they have a sense of humor, they say, well, I may have got it from Uncle Johnny and Uncle Johnny, I got it from Grandpa Bob. And eventually it's going to go back to Adam and Adam's will be like, you know what? I got it from God. I got that sense of humor from him because we're created to laugh. I believe we're created yeah. for joy. They did this study on um, children and they found that children laugh about 400 times a day. But they also did the same study on adults and they found that adults only laugh about 15 times a day. 
And that's like staggering. It's like, what? That, that is crazy. Only 15 times a day. I mean, if you be converted, be like a child. I mean, you know, I want to be childlike, not childish, but I mean, 15 times a day. I mean, we're created to laugh. I believe the kingdom is of laughter. It's of joy. We're created for laughter, created for joy. We see in Romans that Paul says the kingdom is not in meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy is like one third of the kingdom if you look at it. There's a lot of joy going on in the kingdom. It should be overflowing in a part of our lives that the kingdom's within us. It should be overflowing. It should be laughter. That's part of the kingdom. And I think science is catching up with the Bible. They're actually finding that laughter and joy helps physical uh, problems, that laughter and, and joy lowers your blood pressure, that it builds up your immune system, that it releases endorphins. It's, it helps your health. The Bible says a merry heart does good like medicine in Proverbs eleven twenty-five. 25. I think science is catching up with what the Bible already declares and says with laughter and joy. It's catching up with it. I saw this one thing. It said that people who laugh about a 10 hearty minutes, a hearty laugh, it's like exercising uh, 10 minutes with a rowing machine. And it's like, you know what? Forget the the treadmill and the elliptical, I mean, let's just laugh a little bit. You know, let's burn some calories. That's much more better exercising, I think, than running on a treadmill. But there also saw, I saw something as well. It's called laugher size. And I guess it's just some people that come together and they just, they just laugh. I mean, they, that's all they do. They come together. I don't know if it's kind of like therapy or something like that. They just begin to laugh. It's called laugher size. We just sit around and, and laugh with each other. I mean, that, that kind of sounds like the kingdom a little bit, I, I think. That's maybe how church should be a little bit. We just gather around and have some laugher size. You know what? I think we need to laugher size a little bit more, you know? We're just a little too serious sometimes. Sometimes it's like you just begin to laugh in faith and all of a sudden joy begins to come because, you know, it just gets, get caught up in the spirit of joy and God's joy within you, maybe we need to have some laughter size a little bit because that's God's desire for us to have joy. It says this in Psalms. It says Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness more than his companions. You know, he was anointed with the oil of gladness more than his companions. Jesus was full of joy. I mean, people gravitated towards him. They, they were like, man, there's something different with this guy. There's something different about him. They wanted to get around him. I think Jesus had probably the biggest contagious laugh of all people. They're just like, man, there's something different about you. People were attracted towards him because I think he was fully optimistic. He knew the end of it. He, was, he knew the end. saw from an eternal perspective. And he began to just, you know, just love on people. And the joy of God began to overflow. And people are like, man, I want whatever you got. People were gravitated towards him. I guess the question is, are people gravitated? Do they gravitate towards us? Are they wanting to come towards us? Are we attracting people or are we maybe repelling people? I think with the joy of the Lord, we should be, should be attraction coming in our lives, that people are attracted to us because of God's joy in our lives, because people were attracted to Jesus, because he's a happy God. That's who he is. In Matthew 5, you find the parable of the talents. There's this master that comes along and he comes to one and he gives five and another one he gives two and another one he gives one and he leaves and he comes back and he comes back to the five and he says, hey, what did you do with what I've given you? And he says, well, I've invested. I now have 10. And he says, well, well done. Enter into the joy of your master. And he looks at the two and he says, what did you do with what I've given you? And he says, well, I invested it. Now I have four. He says, well done. Enter into the joy of the master. And he goes to the one, and he says, what did you do with what I've given you? And he goes, well, I perceived you to be a cruel, hard taskmaster, and I protected it, and I hid it. Knowing you might be a hard man, and I was afraid to move. I still have what you've given me. And he looked at him and said, you wicked, lazy servant. You wicked, lazy servant. His judgment was not based because he was lazy, but because he misperceived who God was. I mean, God is not that. He's not a cruel, hard task master. That's not who the Father is. And I wonder how many believers, how many Christians have that perception of God that He's a hard, cruel task master, that people miss out on the joys and the pleasures of God that He wants them to experience because they're afraid they're going to displease Him, that He's going to be mad or He's going to be angry, afraid to move because we might displease Him. I wonder how many people 
live that way. How, how many of us live that way? Because we're afraid we're going to displease him. We hold on to it, afraid to move because we see him maybe as a cruel, hard taskmaster. But that's not who he is. He's a happy God. That's who he is. There's a scripture in Luke 15. It talks about a man who had a hundred sheep and that one wandered off. And it talks about this man left the 99 to, to save the one. And it talks about when one person repents, heaven rejoices. There's all, there's rejoicing in heaven. And I believe that God himself is starting that, that he's starting the rejoicing, that he begins to clap and say, that a boy, that's why I sent my son. That was my will for you. They begins to rejoice over that one. The angels hear it and they come together, get in line. They begin to rejoice as well over the one who repents. And then the earth becomes in alignment and they begin to rejoice over the one that was saved and repented because of the one who started the rejoicing, God the Father, because he is a happy God. He's rejoicing. That's who he is. He's a rejoicing God. He rejoices over us. In Psalms, it says, in the presence of God is a fullness of joy. And as his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God is the fullness of joy. And his presence is the access point to joy. I don't know if you've ever just gotten the presence of God and you just like it. Maybe you came in heavy with this it's just heaviness and maybe depression. You get in the presence of God and it's like, that just can't stay in his presence because he is joy. And it's like you get in his presence, you get overwhelmed with his, his, his spirit and his presence. And that begins to wash off of you and joy begins to come. And you begin to experience who he is and his presence. And that just can't stay in there because in his presence is the fullness of joy. And it talks about his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. You know, God wants us to experience pleasure, I believe. I think we think of pleasure sometimes in a negative sense, but God wants us to have pleasure in a, a good sense. And the Bible talks about in Genesis 1 and 1, it says in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth. And each day he said it was good. And each day he said it was good. And God was not talking about just because his work was good, but because he stepped back and said, man, this is good. I take pleasure in this, what I'm seeing right here. And I wonder how many of us have given ourselves permission to step back and say, you know what, man, this is good. My life is good. I take pleasure in this, that we give ourselves permission because it's okay to have pleasure. God wants you to have pleasure that we step back and say, man, I, I take pleasure in this. Or maybe my wife that the Lord has given me that, you know, I, I think this is a good thing and I take pleasure in spending time with her. This, this is good. Or, or my kids or just my family. And I step back and say, man, this is good. I think God wants us to have that kind of pleasure. And he's not upset or think that we're sinning just because we're experiencing pleasure. There is a pleasure that is at his right hand forevermore that he wants us to experience. He wants us to enjoy because that's what he desires for us. He delights in us. He wants us to have pleasure in that sense. The Bible talks about in Nehemiah in 8.10, it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, it's the joy of the Lord that gives us the ability to overcome and not grow weary. It gives us the ability to overcome and not grow weary. It gives us the ability to say, you know what, keep moving forward, keep pressing ahead. Don't throw in the towel. Don't, don't quit because of the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to make it. I'm going to press through. No matter what's happening around me, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to keep pressing ahead. It gives us the ability to, to overcome. And we find the same kind of joy in Hebrews 12 too, where Jesus, it said he endured the cross. He's because of the joy that was set before him, not despising the shame. He saw the cross, but he didn't see the cross, but he saw the joy that was set before him. And he's able to endure the piercing of the nails. He was unable to endure the rejection. He was unable to endure the crown of thorns on his head. He was unable to endure all the difficulty, all the hardship of the cross because of the joy that was set before him. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It is our strength. It is the joy of the Lord that helps us to sustain under trials. When we feel external pressure from every side, when we're hit with something, we have the joy of the Lord is our strength that gives us the ability to bear up under that load that's trying to come up on, on top of us from the external world. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Just like Paul and Silas when they're thrown in jail. 
and it looked bad in the natural, but they began to praise and worship God. They're like, you know what? We're going to rejoice. We choose joy today. We know the God that we serve. We're going to worship him. We're going to praise him. They begin to praise him. They begin to worship him. The prison doors were broken open. The miraculous began to happen because they chose to rejoice. They chose to choose joy, and God began to move on their behalf. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It is our strength. And the one thing the enemy wants to take is your joy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants you to be in discouragement, disappointment, depression. He wants to rob you of your joy. Because if he can steal your joy, he can get your stuff. As Isaiah says it like this, that with joy, we draw water from the well of salvation. With joy, we draw water from the well of salvation. Salvation is holistic. God has made it accessible. Everything that we need, God's favor, God's blessing, it is there for us to, to draw from. And how we draw it, you need a bucket. And the Bible says that bucket is joy. And when we don't have joy, we don't have that bucket to draw from that well of salvation, the water from the well of salvation. When we don't have joy, we've lost our bucket. We can't draw from what grace has made available to us. He wants us to lose that joy. He wants to rob us of our peace. He wants to rob us of the life that God wants for us. He wants to take that from us because he knows if he can, man, you've lost your bucket. You've lost the ability to draw from the well, the water of the well of salvation. That's what he wants, just to make, make you think that you've got to endure, that you've got to suffer for Jesus till one day you get in heaven. Then you can be happy then. But that's not what Jesus died for. Jesus didn't die so one day you can get to heaven and be happy. He died right now so you can wake up every day and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because I serve a happy God. And I'm his kid and I want to reflect who he is. I choose joy. I choose to rejoice. That's what Paul said. It says, rejoice. And again, I say Rejoice. I mean, this guy was in prison when he was writing this. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He went through all these things, had no reason to rejoice, but he said, Rejoice. And again, I say, Rejoice, because he was looking from a different perspective. He had joy, the joy of the Lord working on the inside of him. The joy of the Lord was his strength. And he realized the God that he served was not a hard taskmaster. He wasn't that kind of God, but he was a God that was for him and wanted him to succeed. I believe that's his thought process of who God was, but he wanted the best for him. And God wants us to be full of joy, overflowing, full of joy, that when we wake up and say, you know what, I choose to rejoice today. I have so much to be joyful for, so, so much to be thankful for. Even on my worst day, I have so much to be thankful for, so, so much to be joyful for. And when, no matter what happens in my life, no matter what comes my way, not saying there's times of hardship, times of sorrow, times of weeping, but there should be something on the inside of us that comes from God and the Spirit because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit. I think God wants us to smile. I think we should walk around with a smile on our face. I feel it on the inside, but sometimes I don't translate on the outside. I, I, I'm kind of like, like with my mom, show me your smile. I'm like, mm, I'm just not sure yet. God's like, man, I just want you to smile. I want you to be overflowing with joy in your life. I think that's his desire for us, that we be full of joy. And he wants to fill us with that joy, and that joy would remain in us. And I think we have a choice every day to say, you know what? I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to let him fill me with his joy. I'm going to walk in this joy and you watch what God does in your life when you make that decision every single day. I believe that's his heart, that's his desire because he is a happy God. And as his kids, he wants us to be happy kids as well. That's his heart for us. And I wanna pray for us this morning. I wanna pray that 2019 would be a year we experience his joy like never before, that, that this year that God would begin to work in our hearts, that, that we'd experience him and see him in a new light his heart for us, his desire for us. So I just want to pray this morning. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for your joy. I thank you, Jesus, for everything that you sacrificed, everything that you gave, that you gave yourself for us, that you've redeemed us, that you've restored us, that you've healed us. 
Lord, that you've made us whole. Lord, we have so much to be joyful for. And Lord, we know that you rejoice over us, that you sing over us, God, and you take pleasure in us and you delight in us and that you're not an angry, upset God, but you are a happy God that's smiling over us because of what you've done through Jesus. So I thank you, Father, today. We just thank you for the joy of the Lord. We thank you for the the joy of the Lord is our strength today. We thank you, Father. Maybe some of us are going through hardship right now. I thank you for the joy of the Lord rising up on the inside of us right now. It's going to sustain us in times of trial and times of hardship that says, you know what? I'm going to overcome. I'm going to make it. There's nothing going to stop me. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to quit because the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to keep pressing ahead because of the joy that's set before me. Lord, we thank you for your joy today. I thank you for filling us with your joy today, this morning, Father. I thank you for us being overflowing with your joy today, this morning, Father. I thank you, God, that just begin to erupt out of us, that we can't contain it, that we just begin to laugh, maybe for no reason, God. Maybe, Lord, that we begin to dance for no reason. We begin to just sing for no reason because of your joy on the inside of us that's overflowing out of us, Lord. I just thank you, God, for your joy. We thank you for your joy this morning, Jesus. We thank you that in your kingdom there is joy, God. There is laughter. And I thank you, God, we're going to laugh our way in 2019. We're going to experience your joy like never before, God. I thank you, God, and people are going to be attracted to us. They're going to be like, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is, but I, 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 there's something different about you. And I thank you for people being attracted to us because of your joy on the inside of us, God. Lord, I thank you today for your joy. I thank you for your overwhelming joy this morning, Father. Lord, I thank you that we are a people of joy. And Lord, I thank you for your joy that you give, that you filled us, the joy that remains. Lord, we just thank you today, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for everything you've given us. We thank you that you are a good Father. We thank you for your heart towards us, your desire towards us, that you take pleasure in us. And Lord, I thank you for us taking pleasure in you. And I thank you out of that relationship flows joy and peace and your love, God. So I thank you today for filling your people with your joy. We thank you for your unspeakable joy and it's full of glory today, Jesus. So I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.